Buenas tardes, colegas, buenas tardes, comunidad de la Facultad de Química, buenas tardes, comunidad de la universidad. Es un honor para nosotros presentar esta, este par de conferencias para la tarde del día de hoy. Primero quisiera nombrar a algunas de las personas que están aquí presentes, desde luego nuestros ponentes, eh, el profesor Alana Kurubusik, el profesor Daniel Nocera. Con nosotros está... Lo verán, lo verán. Este, esta conferencia ha sido financiada, organizada con apoyo de la Secretaría de Energía. Estamos muy orgullosos de contar aquí con la presencia del subsecretario, el, el doctor... Leonardo, ¿verdad? Y por la Secretaría General de la, de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, está aquí con nosotros el doctor Eduardo Bárcena. Y para recibir a nuestros uh, distinguidos invitados, el doctor Jorge Vázquez va a dirigir unas palabras. Don't be hiding there, Stan. <risa> Buenas tardes a todos ustedes. Es un verdadero placer ver el auditorio lleno. Esto habla de la expectativa que ha causado este par de conferencias que vamos a tener, singulares en mucho sentido, hasta bioquímicos veo aquí. Eh, porque la fotosíntesis es algo extraordinario y fundamental y quizás el futuro de la energía en el mundo. Me, me da mucho placer ver a tanta gente y saludo a directores de institutos, al señor secretario general, ciertamente, de la UNAM, pero sobre todo eh, a nuestros participantes especiales que han permitido que este coloquio, como queramos llamarlo, esté ocurriendo, a la Secretaría de Energía. Señor secretario, gracias por apoyar a mi vecino Germán Tribucait, éramos vecinos desde chavos, bueno, yo menos chavo que él, y, y hasta apenas nos dimos cuenta que vivíamos casa con casa. Bueno, yo sí sabía, pero él me acaba de reconocer, como 12 años vivimos casa con casa. Y cuando nos encontramos hace ratito, ah, pues sí, ¿tú quién eres? Pues, ¿para qué? Esto fue muy interesante, Germán. Gracias, porque son los que han hecho posible esto, y es una visión muy importante, eh, la Secretaría de Energía, eh, ha hecho un gran esfuerzo y me parece que es muy visionario. Junto con Carlos Amador, la verdad es que ha hecho este esfuerzo, ha financiado este esfuerzo y estamos muy contentos de que así sea, ver tanta gente joven aquí que podría eh, eh, adquirir muy buenas ideas de cómo va a caminar la energía en el futuro. Bueno, no es una de las muchas posibilidades, pero quizá la más viable a futuro, si le sabemos pegar. Eh, entonces, no quiero hablar más. Dan, muchas gracias. Thanks a lot, Dan. Eh, Alan, thanks a lot. Carlos, thanks a lot. And, uh, no entiendo por esto lo dije. Y me gustaría, antes de comenzar este, este coloquio, el señor subsecretario, eh, pasar aquí Leonardo Beltrán y nos dijera alguna palabra de parte de la Secretaría de Energía. Muchas gracias por estar con nosotros y por apoyar este evento. Gracias. Eh, buenas tardes a todos. Tengo preparadas unas palabras, pero realmente quien venimos a escuchar es a, a Dan y a Alan. Yo simplemente quería decirles que esta es la primera de una serie de conferencias magistrales del sector energético que vamos a estar impulsando para, tra para poder traer a gente como nuestro Alan y al profesor Nocera. Muchas gracias a todos por estar acá y les agradecemos mucho al doctor Nocera y al doctor Astur. Gracias.
Just to warn you up a little in your understanding of the English language, I heard that you understand very well when a Mexican speaks. So uh, <laughs> I want to tell you that Daniel Nocera is a Peterson Rockwood professor of energy at Harvard University. He is widely recognized in the world as a leading researcher in renewable energy at the molecular level. His group pioneered studies of the basic mechanisms of energy conversion in biology and chemistry with primary focus in recent years on the generation of solar fuels. He has recently accomplished a solar fuel process that captures many of the elements of the photosynthesis and he has now translated this time to produce the artificial leaf, which was named by Time Magazine as Innovation of the Year for 2011. This discovery sets the stage for a storage mechanism for the large-scale distributed deployment of solar energy. We will hear about that. Would you Professor Daniel. Thank you, uh, Carlos, and the Department of University and Secretary of Energy, and Herman for getting us around and uh, setting up the script, and then all of you for attending. So today, what I'll do is first, I'm sorry. I'm going to speak in English, but that means I'll go very slowly. And these students in the front row saw me taking out lots of quads, so I would talk slowly. That's what I would do <laughs> while they were working. So I want to talk today about this problem about the artificial leaf. But before I do that, I want to talk about energy in a bigger or a bigger scale and a global scale. And so to do that, I first want to start off and tell you about geology. And so you live in, in it's called an epic, a geological epic. If there are geologists over here, they know that. Uh, and it's called the Holocene, H-O-L-O-C-E-N-E. And that means recent coal, and that started 10,000 years ago. And what the Holocene really is, is the people began showing up on the planet. And, and so that was the time where people, as we know people, began occupying the world. But there weren't many of us. And so we, our human activity, just how we live, didn't alter the earth or the earth system. You may have heard in the last few years, actually since the 1970s, a new word showed up. It's really not an official geological epic, but it's a useful word. It's called the Anthropocene. And what the Anthropocene means is now that it's human new, not that we're new humans, but now there's so many of us that we know. And that's around beginning around the 1800s, and that happened that there was huge population growth globally. And with the huge population growth, all of a sudden there were too many of us to the Earth, and we began altering Earth systems. And one consequence is you hear a lot now about climate change, because we need to use lots of energy. And a lot of it is coal, oil, and gas. And so just by our existence, we've begun altering how the Earth works, because there's just so many of us. When you move to Harvard, because I had spent my career at MIT, when you move to Harvard, you have to be like this. <laughs> and so I can't just move to Harvard and be a faculty member, so I decided to start a new geological epic. Okay, so that's my new epic. And I'm calling it the sustainment thing. Okay? And it's actually not really from me. It's from an Australian physician named Brian Fernat. And what the, when we think about sustainability, or at least when I think about sustainability, I think about this, the earth and the environment. When you hear sustainability, you think earth and environment. But that's not what the sustainment thing is. There's one piece, when you think about Earth and environment, there's one thing you're forgetting, and that's you. Okay. 
Okay. So the sustainable environment doesn't just have to do with the earth and the environment. It also has to do with you. And what the sustainable team says is that we all have to be sustainable. And my argument, along with mine for NASA, is you can't have a sustainable earth if you have very wealthy people and very poor people. And I'm going to show you today that you have to, it's not good enough to take care of the earth. You also have to take care of each other. And we have to make sure that we eliminate poverty. And I can tell you in the United States it's going in the wrong direction. Rich become richer and poor will become poor. So we're, we're actually headed on the wrong road. But my argument today is if you don't eliminate poverty, you can't have a sustainable earth. You can't have the environmental integrity. So I'm going to prove that to you because I'm a scientist, and I'm going to do this with equations, actually. So I'm going to prove to you what this means. Because this sounds kind of like a humanist. What does that all these words mean? It seems logical, but I can actually put a math equation behind it to sustain it. And so my contention is, if you have extreme poverty, you can't ever have a sustainable earth. So let me say why. I can calculate how much energy you use globally. You only need to know three numbers. So one number is population. You all use energy. Right? So if you calculate how many calories you use, this would be a good physical chemistry question for your exam <laughs> with humans. They can see these guys are taking physical chemistry. So if I said we figure out you have two thousand calories in a day, I can convert that to joules. And then I can get joules in a day, I can get it to seconds and joules per second is watts. So I can predict how bright a light bulb you are. All of you. Have you ever done that calculation? You're a hundred watt light bulb. That's why you're out so bright and shiny. <laughs> okay. So you're out one hundred watt light bulb. But then to live, because you drive cars, you have to heat your house, you need another thousand watt. And then for all the manufacturing per person, globally, we end up at around ten thousand watt. Because we all need things, clothes and cars and roads. And so even though you only need a hundred watts to survive, you spend ten thousand watts each one of us globally on average. So that means that tells you something about energy. But then all societies aren't equal and they all don't use the same amount of energy. What do I mean by that? So this is sociology, right? Population. This is policy and economics, money per capita. That's gross domestic product per capita. So if you live in a country with a high GDP, then what happens is you use a lot of energy because you manufacture a lot. If you, if you manufacture lots of things, you end up using lots of energy. So it turns out that the wealth of a country, the wealthier you are, the more energy you no, it's not total wealth, it's wealth per person. So, the old president of the United States, George W. Bush, he didn't like me. <laughs> and he put me on an FBI watch list, can you believe that? Um, and so I told him, he would take me off this, right? I'm going to help him from now on, I'm going to become a good person. And I'm going to go around and tell everybody that the United States is the worst because we use the most energy. I'm going to tell them that we aren't anymore. And that's true. Okay. So, because of first habits, so it, it turns out it has nothing to do with anything except countries try to acquire wealth. So, what's a country that's worth, that's about the same GDP per capita, but is older? Canada, right? So, they end up using, they're way worse than the United States just because they need to heat the houses more. And if you go to the South, or you go to the Middle East, they need to cool more. It's that simple. 
And if you live in a big country, then it's hard to have public transportation, so then you have roads. And so if I start normalizing how many there are per area, I can finally show that every country shows up on a straight line. So there's no politics here. It's just that we all need energy as people. And everybody's trying to acquire wealth as a country, so that means you're always increasing energy. So that's GDP per capita. And then this is the science technology piece of the equation, energy per GDP. So what does that mean? If I have an economy and I grow the economy and I have to use this much energy to get there, if I can get to the same GDP but use less energy, then I conserve energy. So whether you realize or not, conservation, I can put an equation behind. I can figure out if the country's conserving because I can see where they been, where their GDP is and have they been using less energy or more energy to get to their GDP. And this is an equation. If I multiply this, this is numerator, denominator, numerator, denominator, and that's what energy use. So even though people make energy sound complicated, and in the United States they always do, why is that? Because if you want to make money, you want I want you to be confused about energy. I'm serious. Right? So the more confused you are about energy, the more money I can make for you. So but it's not that confusing to see how simple it is. So you should realize all these things when you listen to people. So that's the energy equation. Now, why if I can then calculate energy now that we're using and in the future. Because all I need to know is what the population will be, how it will be distributed around the globe, and then I have to know energy intensity. And so I did that uh, many years ago, around six years ago. So I started calculating the total amount of energy in the world. And it turns out in 2012, the, the Earth used 16 terawatts worth of energy. Now remember, energy is different than power. Watt is power, energy per unit time. And I'm using those interchangeably. So let me explain what I mean by 16 terawatts. The world is burning 16 trillion watt light bulbs. And they need to keep it on. It's burning all the time. So you don't need to worry about it. Am I talking about energy? That's why power is better than energy. Because then you say, how much energy in a year, a week? That doesn't matter. Now, if you use power, just you're burning a 16 trillion watt light bulb, and it's on all the time, and you need energy to keep on the 16 trillion watt light bulb on. And so, in 2012, it was that, and when I did my cal do your calculation using that equation I just showed you, you get to 30 terawatts in the year 2050. So that you can double your energy in less than 30 years. So I want you guys to just add 30 years to your life. And now, this is what I'm about to tell you, what you're up against, okay? Luckily, I'm going to be dead. So, I'm not going to So, if I need to get 14 more terawatts, I can calculate, because I'm a scientist, I can start calculating total energy. So, look at this one. I, I, I went around and I took the entire Earth's surface, and I put the fastest growing crop on it. And then if you burn biomass all the way, you get carbon dioxide and H2O. Oman is a physical chemist, so he will deal with thermodynamics. So I know how much energy I get, delta G, it's called free energy, for burning to CO2 and water. I know how many crops I can plant on the face of the earth over a year. So therefore, I can tell you what the total energy content is in all the biomass in the world. It's only six terawatts. Okay? Because so photosynthesis is only 1% efficient. It could have been better, but nobody told plants two billion years ago when they were evolving that they were supposed to be oil wells for us. <laughs> all right? And a plant is no different than you. You eat food. You take in a lot of energy, but you use the energy. A plant's no different than you. It takes in a lot of energy, but only stores 1% of the energy. 
the other 99 that he uses to live. Right? But so this evolution, plants weren't designed to be oil -less. So that's why that's wrong. And then this one I talked about earlier today, I'll just do this because people get confused about nuclear. I don't care if you want nuclear or not. I don't make decisions for people. And that's important for students to understand. You should never get into political arguments. Let politicians worry about that. And that's their job. What you need to do is give politicians the right information so they can make good decisions. And that means I should be able to give them data without making any decisions. That's my own personal view. Right? The politicians are worried about population. And so it's really important. I'm not saying you shouldn't do biomass, and I'm not saying you should do nuclear, but look what I just told you. You have to build one nuclear power plant every one and a half days forever to keep eight terawatts of energy, to keep an eight trillion watt like no one. And the reason for that is the power plant puts out a gigawatt. If I want half of this energy, eight terawatts, I just did a mindset the calculation. Eight terawatts divided by a gigawatt, eight thousand. I'm going to need this in around 40 years, so 8,000 divided by 40 is 200. <laughs> There's 365 days in a year. So you have to build 200 nuclear, nuclear power plants a year for every one, every 1.5 days to get 8 terawatts. Okay? And then I said forever because after 50 years you decommission the power plants because they're dangerous. So for 40 years you're going to build power plants, they'll give you a 10 year rest, and then you've got to keep building all over again. Okay? So that's useful information for a politician who's trying to decide what the energy future should be. And I'm not telling them they should have it or they shouldn't have it. But I gave them the numbers so they can make an educated decision. And then people will make an educated decision because they vote for the politicians. So the bottom line is it's going to be hard to get the 16 terawatts. And that's why you're going to hear Alon speak after me, and I'm going to speak. We really like solar energy because there's so much of it. Have you ever seen anybody turn around and get angry at the sun? <laughs> they always smile. You know? <laughs> and have you noticed that wherever you go, she's following you around, and she's warning you, telling you, use me. <laughs> so I'm always looking out for it, and I'm not listening to you. <laughs> okay. And so let me tell you something. In one day, in one day, more sunlight hits the face of the Earth. Sorry, one day. In one hour, more sunlight hits the face of the Earth than we use entirely in the year as a global population. So that's why, whether you like it or not, you're going to be a solar someday. It's just a question of when are you going to get there. Right. And right now we're kind of hooked on coal, oil, and gas. But you can't be for very long. And I only worry about the Earth for long periods of time. Right. The only question is, do you destroy the entire human population in the next 200 years of the planet? That used to bother me, but I knew a man named Kurt Vonnegut. He was an author. And just before he died, he, used to, he heard me speak about energy. We used to do a few things together. And he said, Dan, you always say, I'm worried about the planet. I'm worried about the planet. And he said to me, stop worrying about the planet. Because she's a big organism like you are. And what happens when something begins invading you, a germ or a bug? You have an immunological response, and you kill it. <laughs> and so he said to me, the Earth has an immunological response. And he said, when we get really irritating to her, she'll just kill us. And that made me feel good. I don't know why. <laughs> and that's because the Earth is way more important than you. But we tend to, tend to forget that. We think we're at the top of the two. We aren't. The Earth is. The Earth is going to survive for a long time, even if there's not the climate change, and we all disappear. Just let, I'm just, it should make you feel good. The earth will keep on going. Okay? So, if I tell you, the one thing I didn't tell you was about energy. When I did my calculation, I had to tell you how much energy would you save. And so, in my calculation, I had to make an estimate of how much energy the global population would save 40 years from now. 
I made the assumption that the Earth would stay 14 terawatts, or all the energy it's using today almost, it will save in 40 years. And you still need 30 terawatts, and you're at 15 right now. So that's a scary number. I'm saying if you save 14 terawatts, you still need 14 terawatts. And then you can say, why is that? And now I'm going to get to the sustainability. Because the push for energy is coming from four parts of the world that don't use energy right now. There's 1.8 billion people with no electricity. Total, there's 3 billion very, very low energy users. In the next 35 years, there'll be 3 billion new people born to the planet, and they're being born in that part of the world. So in the next 35 years, we're going to get 6 billion new energy users. And they don't have much energy and money. They're poor. And so that is why I told you I would prove to you you can't have a sustainable Earth unless you take care of them. And if they use the wrong energy, you're really in trouble. And you can't tell them not to use energy. Your job as a scientist and a policymaker and a politician is to figure out, because now we're all in this together. It's not Mexico, it's not the U.S., it's not China. We're all in the same boat and we're trying to save us on the planet, right? It's a global problem now. And so how are we going to do that? And that means, I call it non-legacy because they haven't inherited an energy system you have, right? Because we all have these lights and there are wires in the ground, and you've already built big power plants, right? But the poor people don't have energy because they haven't had enough money. So they actually, and sometimes people say this about me and get me angry, they say, oh, isn't Dan no terrorist nice? He's helping poor people. So I will tell you, I am not a nice person. That's a problem. And I don't like people saying I'm trying to help poor people. You know how I do it? Poor people are helping me because they don't have an energy system, they can be the earliest adopters of new technology. And they're going to teach us in the legacy world how the future should look. And we're going to keep using an energy system looking backwards over our back. So the poor are actually going to be the saviors of the world for us. That's why you should think about this. And because they can be the earliest adopters. And if you're going to do something then that they can use, where you don't have a lot of capital for a lot of investment, then you have to be a really good scientist. To make, can you make energy that's really cheap so that's affordable to them? So that's what I'm going to tell you quickly. How am I going to make a cheap thing? So right here, I want to show you what I did. This is, by the way, part of such a mistake hiring me. I used to do research, and I, and I was valuable. Now, my life is over. So let me tell you how I do research. I sit in my office, and I go on Google, and I make talks. Then I run into the lab, and I tell my students, look what I just discovered. <laughs> and now I'm getting old, but I know it. So they're tapping on my head, and they walk me back to my office, and they say, you sit here. And we'll keep doing important work in the lab. This is how my, my lab is now working. And so here's a Google plot I did. I took how many Boeing 777s were made in 2006? It turns out there's 74 Boeing 777s. And then I said, how much do they weigh? And how much do they cost? And I just took the cost divided by weight. And then on this axis, I said, how many did they make? And I did it for all these things. Here's the automobile. And I have a curve. Without knowing anything about the technology, I can now predict cost by knowing weight per pound and how many you make. That works for everything. You could say, oh, no, Sarah, a 777 isn't very different than an automobile. I tell, I'll tell you what it doesn't work for. Kill, farm, right? That's not... That's not how you make machines. It doesn't work for commodity chemicals, and it doesn't work for Intel chips, like electronics. But that's not how you make energy systems. You make energy systems like you do cars and stuff. You build stuff, right? 
So this is manufacturing 101 if you're a civil engineer. This is how cost scales. And most scientists forget you better have something that's very lightweight if you want low cost for price of what you're making. And you could say, well, if 777 isn't working very well versus an object, what else do you make a lot of? I'm not, I'm not lying. <laughs> I called McDonald's and I asked them how much did the patty weigh, the tomato, the lettuce. It literally falls on my curb. So now I've equated a hamburger to a bone of 777. Right? So from a point of view, is what type of problem do I have? Got? And this is an important thought. This tells you why the poor don't have energy systems. Because how do we build energy systems in the legacy world? We build one big power, big thing, a power plant, a nuclear plant, a grid. It's one thing, it's heavy, so it's very expensive. Because just wait, I can never do better than $10 per pound. So if it's really heavy, it's going to be really expensive. And that's called capital expenditure if you're an economy. And so the way we build legacy systems is we have a high capex cost up front. Then I own a power company, so I have to get the billion dollars. But now you want the energy, so I sell it back to you. I make a profit. The profit is I recover my capital expenditure over some kind of time called return on investment. And then I charge a little bit more, so I keep making money. So that's how the world works. Poor people don't have money, so the poor model falls apart. That, this is a model for the rich part of the world, not the poor part of the world. And so this doesn't work. And this is, this is how simple I am. I wish I could say I'd think more complicated. If I look at a graph and the side of the graph doesn't work, then I turn my eyes to the other side of the graph. And I literally asked this question to my group a few years ago. Can we make a, a fast food hamburger of energy? And I want to make it like a hamburger. A hamburger just has like a bun. You have the hamburger, you just slap it all together, and you just like flying the bar. Okay? <laughs> so, could I make an energy system that's like a hamburger? Right? That's the first question. What is a lightweight energy system? Plants. Plants, what they do is they take light, they collect the light, you give the plant water, the plant then splits the water to oxygen and hydrogen. For the non-scientists out there, water is H2O. Oxygen is too hard. Stop that right there. <laughs> okay? And so then you break the bonds. You rearrange the bonds of water to make hydrogen and oxygen. That's where you store all the sunlight. At night, when the sun goes down, the plant takes H2 and CO2 from the atmosphere and it makes sugar. But that's a dark reaction. All the solar energy is stored up front in water splitting to make oxygen and hydrogen. And plants do it simply. If I could make a little hamburger, a little energy hamburger, I'm going to hand it out to everybody in the world and say I could operate on some volume of water, what type of volume of water do I need to give the planet all the energy it needs? We can do that, because I know how much energy is in one mole of water. There's a certain amount of energy. Here's the Harvard swimming pool. Okay? The hardest thing in this calculation is to find out how many liters of water is in the Harvard swimming pool. There's 2.8 million liters. So, say I gave you all the little hamburgers of energy, and then you had water, and you only have to have a little bit of water, but globally, I have one swimming pool. And per second, I'm turning it over. So that doesn't mean I use it in a day. Per second, I'm taking one swimming pool of water to hydrogen and oxygen. I'm not using it up. Because at night, what are you going to do? When the sun goes down, you're going to recombine that hydrogen and oxygen, get the water back, and you get the energy back out. Because I just release the energy. I burn the hydrogen. So you're not using up water. You're just turning it over. If I could turn that pool of water over with a distributed energy system at per second, that's how much energy do you save? Logic pool, I can start slowly per second. Remember I told you you need 14 terawatts and how far to get there with nuclear biomass? 
38 parallels. And that's why I'm telling you, you have to go here someday. There's no escape to it. Because with one third of the swimming pool of water, I can take care of the earth problem. I just use the sun. Everybody has access to it. You don't have to be wealthy. And the thing I was about to tell you, we even can use dirty water. We can even use urine. Why would I do that? First, I'm a deep research director, so a student I didn't like most, they said, you go try it out on your own. <laughs> but the other reason is, if I can split dirty water by hydrogen and oxygen, when it recombines, what you get? Clean drinking water. So now, all of a sudden, maybe they have the point to give you clean drinking water to food. And so my argument is someday, this is how you're living, you're definitely headed there. Because of all these calculations. Again, I'm not making a political statement. They can just look at the math and it becomes obvious this is where the world's headed. And people have been saying this for a long time. I wish I was saying something new. I just put numbers behind it. Because in 1912, this was an Italian photo chemist, Jimmy John. He said, if our, our civilization based on coal and oil should be followed by one that's based on solar energy, that would be nice for human happiness. And then look what he said, fix the solar energy through suitable photochemical reactions with new compounds that offend the garden secret of plants. Well, it turns out, 2006, the cover came off the garden secret of plants. This man, Jim Barber, he's a biologist at Imperial College, got the crystal structure. It was a fuzzy one. It was for people in the audience who are biologists with a three-point angstrom crystal structure, so it was a little fuzzy. But Jim was able to get, yes, it's like taking a Kodak a selfie. It's like taking a selfie <laughs> of the photo. It's a Kodak moment of, of a plant. And so, when he did that, we could go look at his crystal structure and we found out that the thing that was splitting the water when the sunlight came in was this little cube, look at, of just oxygen and manganese ions. Manganese ions is a metal in the periodic table, earth abundance, and calcium. So we have a little cube of manganese, and that's in the leaf, and the leaf is catching sunlight, funneling the energy to it and splitting water. And it's doing it in simple conditions. And the way it works is the sunlight hits that at membrane, and then the plant, and Alan is one of the world's experts in this, makes what's called an exoton. It's complicated physics. Plants are complicated. But they're simple in their function. Light comes in, and it makes a charge, a negative charge. If I make a negative charge, I have to have a positive charge, because I can't create a charge. And so one part of the charge has one direction in the membrane, the other part of the charge, the negative part, has the other. When you guys plug your stuff in the wall, you're moving current. When, when electrons or poles move, that's current. So what the plant is, it's making a current. Leaves are buzzing with electricity. People don't realize that, but no wire. Okay? And then it takes the charge and then it stores it in that manganese compound. And then when the manganese compound gets charged up four times, it splits water and it makes oxygen and hydrogen. Okay, so that's how the plant works. So we said, could we build something that functionally is the same thing? Light comes in, wireless current, and I make catalyst, something that looks like the leaf that then gets charged up and splits water to oxygen and hydrogen. So that's what we did, and it has to be out of a glass of water. I don't want to have a bunch of engineers building some complicated thing. I just want to be able to walk around, drop it, have some poor person find, find some water, take my leaf, get some sun, bam. Okay? Matter of fact, I have to drink clean drinking water until the poor parts of the world guess what they do with it. Drink it. Right? So you have to make sure this works out of dirty water. And I'm just going to tell you, these reactions, sometimes it's terrible in science. You realize all this stuff, and then you go to look in a book. This is why you do research. You guys are the undergraduates are still learning out of books. The graduate students are creating new knowledge. You look in a book, and you find out nobody's ever invented the science I need that solves the problem. 
So then you have to be patient and go invent the science so that you can keep going. Sometimes I say it's like a big pond, a big lake. I gotta get to the other side. Stupid scientists just keep running as fast as they can. They jump, they fall in the water, they drown. And then you have another one of it. A smart scientist will say, I'm gonna go invent a new area of science and put that stone there. Then we're going to invent another one to put that stone there, and then we walk across the lake to the other side. Okay, so that's what you have to do. And just to tell the students, it was a long time. It took us 20 years. We had to do this thing called the multi-electron problem. A lot of those guys, because he's also kind of a, he's really a physicist, also a chemist. Physicists have trouble. They are really good. They act like they're smart, but they're not. They can do one electron really well, but as soon as you put another one there, they get all confused. <laughs> <laughs> so this, these are multi-electron problems. They're four electrons, and you've got a couple of them for protons. And protons are classical objects, Newton. And electrons are quantum mechanical objects. And the way you can think about it is that this is an electron wave function. Electrons spread out. But proton wave functions can't, because they're Newtonian. And so what happens is for a given distance, I gotta move an electron from point A to B. The electron can buzz because it's quantum mechanical, but the fourth proton is a Newtonian. It can't keep up with the electron and it gets decoupled. And so we had to invent all the experiments and some of the theory, at least begin the theory, to start explaining how electrons and protons can couple. And the reason for that is when you split water, you get a couple of four electrons, multi electrons, but four protons. That's the chemical reaction. And we did that. And I'll just tell you, these guys here invented that compound. That this is the compound I showed you, which was in the leaf. It just has manganese oxygen. That's that one. But we did that doesn't look, this doesn't look like that. But now let me show you something. If I take those manganeses and turn them into coal balls, and then I take one of these and do a head-to-tail dimerization, and then I rotate it 45 degrees, I get that. So it's really like a leaf. And this thing works just like a leaf. This compound splits water. It's self-healed. That's why you can use any water source. It looks like a leaf. And it even does PCET, like the leaf. The next thing is we have to make hydrogen. We did that pretty quickly. We used alloys because once we have the oxygen down, the hydrogen wasn't that hard. We took uh, an alloy of nickel, molybdenum, and zinc. And within, uh, with some of this stuff, you guys don't need to worry about. I get paid. I got to figure it out. But we did. So just believe me. I got the hydrogen. The next thing is now I only have two catalysts, but how am I going to get light in and out? So what my students did, these three students, they took silicon. Now silicon, when you split water, you need 1.25 volts. You need a battery, basically, to have 1.25 volts. I don't want to use a battery. Batteries don't, they store energy, but they aren't creating energy. You've got to charge them up. So I want to use the sun directly to make 1.25 volts. Silicon can only make 0.6 volts. This one only made 0.6 volts. So I don't have enough energy to split water. And the idea was, I'm going to take the silicon, I have to protect it, because when you make oxygen near silicon, silicon, Si plus O2, makes SiO2, that sand. So then I make this beautiful thing and I'll turn to sand. So that's not good. So we have to put a protective layer in here to keep the oxygen away from the silicon. But then this only has 0.6 volts. So I have to put a little extra electricity. So we put electrodes on it. And then all I'll show you is here it is in the dark. And, and I start splitting water with my catalyst. This is where I told you it would happen, around 1.25 volts. But this is different than a regular electrode out of the wall of the silicon. When I then hold it up to the sunlight, I generate internally 0.6 volts from the silicon. And so look at what happens. All of a sudden, I'm splitting water, but I'm splitting it at a much lower potential. And it turns out, at any potential, this is called, no matter how hard I drive the system, 
I'm totally reduced it by 26 volts. I mean, I have to work with her because I'm using the sun to help me, but not the whole distance. So the question is, can I add a third cell? Have no wire? Can I do it out of the glass of water? So that's the artificial leaf. We use these three flavors of silicon, and when you put them together, you get 1.7 volts. That's plenty of energy. I put the protective coating, then I put the cobalt catalyst on top, and I put this here. And now sunlight comes in, hits the silicon, the positive hole goes this way, and the negative hole goes that way. And then the catalyst collects the hole, they get charged, and then this really works. You can literally, and I just found out, where are they doing this again in Mexico? Chihuahua. They just read my paper, it really works. Even in <laughs> So here it is, literally, just take it, drop it in the water, and now what you're seeing is here's all the holes coming up here. The catalyst is getting them, it's doing that photon couple DT, it's taking quantum mechanics with Newton, and it's making oxygen. The four photons are left behind, they run around to the back side where the nickel is, and there's the hydrogen. So all of a sudden, I have something that you can just drop in any water source, hold it up with sunlight, and do that really hard photosynthetic reaction that people have talked about for a hundred years. And it looks like a hamburger. <laughs> because the silicon is the meat pad, so that's the hamburger. The cheese is the IPO, the top one is the cobalt, and the bottom. I told you I would make this thing. <laughs> And you can literally make this just by coating a silicon sound by. Now, what can I tell you that I hate about the show? Like you like you like your children, and then you don't like your children sometimes. And they get upset, right? So I like my child, and sometimes I don't like my child. So what don't I like about it? It makes hydrogen. And you guys don't use hydrogen. You need it, because that's the evidence. So the first thing is I have to, is anybody going to be using this next year? Not unless everybody gets fuel cells, because fuel cells get tight, and nobody's doing that yet. So that's how long technology is up. The other problem is you can't get hydrogen everywhere. There's no gas station to go get hydrogen. But all the car companies have fuel cell cars, hydrogen. So the problem is trapped for fuel cell cars when you can make hydrogen. Well, now you can start thinking about making hydrogen locally at your house, off your roof, and store the hydrogen, right? And your house becomes a gas station. <laughs> and it becomes a power station. So that's what we're doing. One other thing we're doing is we're evil scientists. So we're taking little bacteria, and we're using synthetic biology, because we know the genetic code of this, a bug. And we make the bug start breathing in our hydrogen and then it breathes in CO2, and then we went in and we took the plant, the calcium cycle, and we genetically encoded it in the bud, and now the bud is making diesel fuel. Isn't that weird? So that's what we're doing. So there's two ways we're doing this. One is we're going with technology, with hydrogen, and the other is they said, don't fight it, join us. And we're trying to now take our hydrogen and go directly to liquid fuel. So we've done this before. I just want to remind you, in the 70s, you guys weren't born yet. <laughs> Let me tell you what happened in the 70s. Those so older people were doing it. <laughs> they, they didn't have computers. You know what they did? IBM had the computers. And they were called mainframes. And you would send your, they would send you the information. It was centralized on computers. Well, the way we live, we have centralized energy. These guys, by the way, IBM missed the whole market here. They never thought any of you would be smart enough to do computing. So they said, there's no way this thing's going to work, right? There was some Harvard undergraduate who started messing around and sailed out of Harvard. Look at that, Bill Gates. Okay? So you can sail out and just decide, I'm not going to class anymore. I'm doing something more important than I can have it. You did that with the dormant. So, personal computers came, so what I'm saying is you can have personalized energy. And the beauty of it is your house is a power and gas station. And that starts because, remember, energy is tied to wealth. If I can get a core of energy, I can start making them wealthy. 
and I start decreasing the gap between the rich and the poor. And that's the sustainable. So that's what Google Innovation can deliver. I'm working with a man in India. He knows all about this, Mr. Tata. So Mr. Tata and I have joined forces. And he's been trying to tell scientists when you start paying attention and do new science that allows you to do things simply and low cost. Because I have a bunch of poor people in my country that need energy. So that's what he's been trying to tell scientists to do. I listen to that. And to keep with the hamburger, so now we can start thinking about serving seven billion, forget, forget that million of McDonald's. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. So you mentioned there is water usable. So is sulfur usable for this um use? Sulfur? Sulfur. Yes, we use our water. Matter of fact, as in the storage system, when you're a research director, um, I asked my students that question. Could you get salt water? And I live in Boston. So I just figured they would go to the bed and get salt water. And the next day I looked at my lab and they ordered from a chemical supply company ocean water. <laughs> and it worked perfectly. And it also worked okay out of the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> so what happened, what happened with the remaining salt? Yeah, so that's a good question. So that's a good engineering question. When you're doing energy storage, you're making the water, and then you're, next, you're re diluting the system. So it would be cloud water, it would get cloudier, then you would re dilute it again. But when you're drinking it, you're pulling the water out of the system. So it actually is a much more complicated engineering problem to make drinking water because of your question. You have to keep flushing out the salt or the sludge. Well, if it's an energy system, you don't need that because you just keep re-diluting. You just keep re-diluting the water. So you're on to an important point. It's a much tougher thing to get the clean drinking water from an engineering point of view. So uh, I, I didn't get that final cost. So more or less, how much it costs? You see yeah. that we were working? Yeah, good, good question. I can tell you in a different way. To do poor people at 100 watts continually for 24 hours, that's 2.4 kilowatt hours. And in Europe, the average energy use is 24 kilowatt hours. So I can give the poor one tenth the amount of energy of somebody in Europe if I have the size of the, a door and I only need one, you know, the drinking bottle of water? See this one right there? That's enough for a hundred watts for the for continually for the poor. That's it. And then the cost is a very sad story. So when we started this, I can make hydrogen at four dollar gas gallon equivalent. So one kilogram of hydrogen is equal to one gas gallon of gasoline. With everything that I was doing, it was four dollars. The magic price was three dollars. So I was right around the corner. And guess what happened? Fracking. And you can get hydrogen from natural gas. In the last three years it went from three dollars gas gallon equivalent to now a dollar fifty. So now I'm not competitive again because of fracking. And you can't complain about it. That's free market. So I just gotta get even better now. Ready? Yes. Yay! Let me see. <laughs> one more quick question, maybe? Yeah, one more question. Uh, is there a problem with the cost of the silicon and the silicon germanium part of the... Oh my energy? gosh. Thank you for asking that. Yeah. Because if it's silicon, single crystal silicon is only a dollar now for a while. It's come way down because 
China built a huge silicon plant. That's a capex cost again. So China has driven the cost of silicon down. There's no plan for aquamorphic silicon. So amorphic silicon is too expensive. Okay? Now listen along. I'm going to tell you something. He has a boat of Mars and silicon. So that's a real, that's another thing I don't like about that child, is the Mars and silicon. So you know what we need? We need new materials that maybe are organic photovoltaics because if somebody is smart enough to figure that out, I could take the organic photovoltaic and just fly it into my artificial leaf and drive clouds down. So I wonder if we're smart enough to solve that problem. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Thank you,